Being at some time in a psych ward, I think that some of us probably have spent some time ourselves as patients in a psych ward, and certainly many of us have visited psych wards. And I think probably there are also many of us who are uh, staff, uh, nurses or counselors or doctors in psych wards. And I think the uh, thing that strikes many of us uh, about a psych ward is the terrible fact that the atmosphere is so often so disrupted by the emotional sicknesses of the other patients that the atmosphere itself tends to make anyone who comes into it sick, even if they aren't sick themselves when they first go in. And I think many of us would attest to that, that often there is such an atmosphere of emotional instability and such an atmosphere of insecurity and such an atmosphere of irritation and discontent that whenever you go into that atmosphere yourself, you find that you are being bombarded by all this emotional instability and it tends often to have the effect of upsetting you yourself and disturbing you. Now, this is no reason for uh, abolishing psych wards or for saying that no one has ever been helped in a psych ward. I think there are many of us who have presumably received some help in a psych ward. But it is important to see that this is one of the real limitations that you have in psychology wards, in wards for psych patients. That whenever you group together a number of people who are suffering from emotional instability, they tend, by their own erratic behavior, to uh, expand and extend that emotional instability to the other people around them. And that's a, just a fact of life that you have to face. And so one of the limitations that nurses and doctors and counselors and even mildly ill patients face in a psych ward is trying to hold out from their own hearts the uh, shouting and the noise that is coming from other patients who are sick in different ways. Uh, this is what this verse of Romans really says, if you look at it, that we're studying uh, this morning. It's Romans 6 and 19. And I'm thinking of the middle part of the verse, which if you label the first part A and the second part B and the last part C, it would be six, uh, Romans 6, 19b. It's page 981. Romans 6 and 19b, the middle of the verse. For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity. And that's really the truth that God is revealing to us there, you see, that as you yield your members to impurity, you end up yielding them to greater and greater impurity, to greater and greater iniquity. In other words, the more you use your body to express certain impurities or certain iniquities or certain emotional excesses, the more that impurity or that iniquity or that emotional excess grows and begins to take over you yourself and take over the atmosphere. The Greek really makes it clearer because a literal Greek translation reads like this. You presented your members as slaves of uncleanness for the power of uncleanness and of lawlessness for the power of lawlessness. In other words, greater and greater is not actually in the Greek. But uh, the Greek says, you presented your members as slaves of impurity for the power of impurity. In other words, as you present your members to impurity, the power of impurity grows wherever you are. And as you present your members as slaves of iniquity, so it's for the power of iniquity. So the power of iniquity grows itself. Linsky, the, the Lutheran commentator that uh, I think is just very reliable on Romans, says this power itself grows the more men lend their members as slaves to do its will. 
So the power of evil grows the more men lend their members to do its will. The power of impurity grows the more men and women lend their members to it to do its will. The power of emotional instability grows the more men and women lend their own emotions to do its will. And one of the problems, of course, with the psych wards is that there is a school of psychology that does not believe this truth that God has revealed to us. There is a school of psychology that, in fact, teaches the opposite. And often, this kind of psychology governs what goes on in the psych wards. And the psychologists of this school would say, you ought to express what is inside you. If you're angry, let it out. If you resent a friend, let it out. If you don't let it out, you'll get pimples, or you'll, uh, you'll get guilt complexes, or you'll become a miserable, inhi inhibited human being. But they tend to teach, loved ones, that just as people would teach in the old days, you know, that dreadful things would happen to you if you involved yourself in some sexual uh, immorality, so they tend to have their little witch hunts too. And they tend to say that if you ever keep anger inside you, then you're going to be in trouble. And it's vital to express clearly everything that is inside. The result is, of course, that the psych wards particularly can be so noisy and chaotic with everybody getting out their anger and their frustration at their mother or their pet dog or their irritability with their boss that there's just a continual atmosphere of emotional chaos and instability. And in fact, of course, God's Word says that if you actually do express the things that are inside you like that, the power of that thing that you're submitting yourself to actually grows in the universe. It actually increases in intensity. It doesn't decline. And so we're really forced to see by this truth that is stated here in Romans 6 and 19 that getting everything out does not actually cure things. It actually makes matters worse. It actually enables the feeling inside you to increase in intensity. So many of us have found at home, haven't we, that we've wanted to yell at uh, our mum or our brother or our sister, but we've held it in for a long time. And then we couldn't hold it any longer, and we started to let it go. Or a husband and wife, at the beginning of their marriage, felt, oh, the marriage is supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to be something where I never am bad-tempered with the other person, where I never criticize the other person. And you walked like that. And that's why we talk about the honeymoon so often, don't we? We say the honeymoon lasted so long in our marriage because we're careful for a while of each other. And then bit by bit we begin to let it out and express it. And you know what happens to the atmosphere. I don't need to tell you that the atmosphere doesn't improve. The atmosphere in the home becomes noisier and noisier and more insensitive and more insensitive. And surely, brothers and sisters, that's how people progress from a relatively small degree of difference and disagreement with each other to the time when they can actually take a gun and shoot each other. Surely that's how it progresses. You express it, and once you've expressed it, it grows a little stronger, and you become a little more comfortable with it, and the other person gets a little more used to it, and you express it a little more until bigger and bigger it grows, until eventually you can't control it at all. Now, that's what God's Word is saying, you see. The more you express lust, the stronger it grows. The more you yell at each other, the more insensitive you become. The more you express your impatience, the more you feel you have the right to be impatient. Now, really, the truth is, you see, that the words mentioned in Romans 6 and 19 are very neutral words, really, or it's a very neutral entity. If you look at it, for just as you once yielded your members to impurity. Now, the word for, impure, for members is tamele, and it means your limbs. And actually... Your limbs, you know, your mouth, your, your hands, your arms, your whole body, your face, your ability to change your face into different expressions, your members, the parts of your body, are actually simply neutral organisms, neutral animal organisms. 
And to tell you the truth, they can be trained to react one way or to react another way. And that's the truth of it. If your your mouth gets used to smiling, then your mouth will tend to go into a smile. Now, it won't dominate you. You can still pull it back. But your mouth will tend to smile more often than not if you use it for smiling. If you are sarcastic and cynical with people all the time because you're defensive and you're afraid, really, your mouth will get used to smirking. And you'll find if you sit there just doing nothing and happen to look in the mirror, you're smirking. Yeah. I didn't mean to smirk, but my mouth fell into a smirk. And that's true. That's why, if I had the overhead, I'd show you, that's why we draw those little figures, you know, a little mouth with a smile on it, you know, and the mouth goes that way because it's smiling. And then it goes that way if it's frowning. Because really, people's faces are neutral animal organisms that can be trained to behave in a certain way almost naturally. Now, I agree with you, you can always override them. But when you're not overriding them or ruling them anyway, they'll tend to fall into the pattern that you have trained them in. You can see it in so many ways. If you're a table tennis player and I do that, well, you do that. You know, you chop. It's just natural. If I do that, you stand back. You know, there are certain movements that I do and you just have a physical reaction to them. If you're a tennis player and you're not Bobby Riggs, you know, and I do that, then you will chop back. You'll respond to me in regard to various things that I do. If you play baseball and I do that, you'll do that. In other words, your body is trained to respond in certain ways to certain provocations and stimulations. I'm not teaching behavioral psychology, but I'm suggesting to you that if you train your body to go in a certain direction again and again and again, then it does tend to get used to that. It doesn't make you behave that way all the time. It isn't determinist. But it does tend to fall into that pattern. Now, that's really what God is saying, you see, in Romans 6 and 19b. For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity. And the truth is that if we get used to yielding ourselves to anger and to expressing impatience and to expressing irritability, instead of keeping it inside, then eventually those powers inside will become greater and greater qualities of our lives. And more and more our lives will be angry lives. More and more our lives will be irritable lives. More and more our lives will be unclean lives. So loved ones, I I do encourage you to see the difference between the fallible uh, and invalid psychological principle on the one hand and the truthful and valid spiritual principle on the other. That in fact it is important what you use your bodies for. The way you use your bodies, the way you give them over to certain attitudes, that will tend, that power will tend to increase and dominate your life. Now the psychologist would come back this morning and say, well, what do you want us to become? Miserable little inhibited beings? who have all kinds of harmful passions eating away with ulcers inside us so that we become sick and depressed? Is that what you want us to become? At least, surely, if you let the thing out, you can analyze it and do something about it. And that's what I thought. And I worked on my jealousy, you know. And I tried to get the jealousy out. That wasn't hard. And then I tried to analyze the jealousy. And I worked out, all right, the jealousy is partly there because of inferiority. All right, it's partly because of inferiority uh, that comes really from my mother. I I won't go into the the, the reasons for that. But it's partly, all right, it's inferiority and it partly comes from my mother. Okay, that's why. And then the jealousy is there also because I have a burning ambition to be somebody. And when I see somebody that seems to be being somebody better than I am, then I get jealous. Yeah, all right. Now, I know why it's there. And brothers and sisters, I analyzed it, and I got it out, and I tried to put it in psychological terms, and then I began to try to think positively of my contemporaries. Because I knew you didn't have to just analyze it, you had to think positively and think lovingly about them. So I analyzed the jealousy, and I started to try to think positively. Indeed, I started to do those little tricks, you know, praise them. Ah, I must praise that person. Yeah, okay, that was very good what you did, yeah. 
or I should admire them, you know. And I tried to work up a feeling of admiration for them, and it was just from the mouth out. And I think many of us have found that. That we've come to the place where, yeah, we've analysed the stuff, and we've brought it out and we've reanalysed it, and we've hashed it and rehashed it, and we've read Dale Carnegie's books, and we've read Vincent Peale's books, and we've tried in all kinds of ways to overcome these things, but after having analysed them completely and tried all the psychological tricks we could, still, I find myself jealous. I was just jealous. That was it. I still had jealousy inside. And that's why, you know, it was such a relief for me and such a ray of hope when I saw that the reason I was jealous was not because of my mum and it was not because of my ambition. The reason I was jealous was I thought I had the right to be jealous. I felt I was, in fact, the best person in the world. I felt, really, I was better than most other people, and if only people would begin to look at it the right way, they'd recognize that too. <laughs> and, and I began to see that I was jealous because I felt I had the right always to have things my way. I felt I had the right always to defend my rights, always to insist on my dignity, always to have everyone bow to what I wanted them to do. And I began to see slowly that I was jealous because I just thought I was God and that God wasn't God and nobody else was God, but that I was God. And in lots of little ways in my life, I dealt with others as if I were God. And I saw that it was just a massive monster self inside me. And you know we've spent the past few months talking about that. And oh, what a relief it was when I saw that that self was a power that was too great for me to deal with. And that it was a supernatural power that I could not change or tame or train. And it was so good, you know, when I saw that. Romans 6 and verse 6, uh, and you know it almost without looking at it. We know that our old self was crucified with him. And it was so good when I saw that was really crucified with Jesus. That old self that gets jealous, that was destroyed by God in Jesus. And then, of course, it suddenly hit me. Yeah, but why is it so alive inside you? And it was then that I saw that I wasn't at all ready to let my old self be crucified. And the reason why it still dominated me was it was really the lie of the old self that dominated me. I was not myself willing to be crucified with Jesus. And I began to see that the way to enter into this in actuality was in Romans 6 and verse 11. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And I had lots of plans for my future and lots of desires for people to think well of me. And I certainly had no plans to go to my own funeral. And it was a battle, you know, to come to the point where I saw that I was never going to be released from that old self unless I did come to the place where I was really willing to die with Jesus and to die to self and to die to my right to defend myself and to assert my own value and to get my own way in all kinds of situations. And that, you know, for me was the first step in. A readiness to reckon myself dead, to treat myself as deserving nothing that Jesus did not feel he deserved. And as demanding nothing from people that Jesus did not feel he had a right to demand. And then, well, it was Romans 6 and 13, you know. A readiness not to yield my members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but to yield myself to God as a man who has been brought from death to life, and my members to God as instruments of righteousness. And it was that day-to-day -day then obedience to the Holy Spirit that delivered me from that dreadful desire to be jealous and that desire to be irritable and to be angry with other people. And that's what we have talked about for some time. The mir miracle by which God the Holy Spirit delivers you from that selfish will. Now, Really, what we want to do is go a step further today. Because what we saw two Sundays ago was that God frees us, therefore, from the desire to disobey him. And so when it comes to coveting somebody else's coat or somebody else's car, you find you're free at last to obey that commandment. You're free not to covet. Where it says if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty of the judgment, you find that you're free from anger so that you can obey God and you can avoid being angry with them. 
You remember we said last uh, two Sundays ago that it brings you into a perfect obedience. It brings you into a place where you're, you're at last free not to sin. You're at last free to obey God. You remember the other thing we said was it's not sinless perfection. It's perfect obedience. And what I'd like to share this morning is just a little more on why it isn't sinless perfection. Now, the reason it isn't sinless perfection is really because we have minds and emotions and bodies that have been affected by the lack of the Holy Spirit over generations. So our minds were created in perfect balance. We would have worked out Einstein's theory precisely without half the trouble that he had, if we had been as we were at the very beginning of creation. Our minds were in perfect balance, but through the lack of the Holy Spirit, the minds have become impaired, so that we often make mistakes in judgment. So often, you love a person with your whole heart, and you'll intend with a perfect, pure intention, because of the cleansing of the Holy Spirit, to want to reveal Jesus to them, but your mind will lack perfection in judgment. And you'll judge wrongly and you'll say the wrong thing. Or you'll say it in words that will actually confuse them. And so you won't be walking in sinless perfection, you see. You'll be walking in perfect obedience. You'll have perfect intention to please the Father. But you won't always be able to do things perfectly. You remember the illustration we used one morning about the little blind girl who wanted to write a letter to her dad that would really please him on his birthday, so she got the piece of paper and she tied lines of string, you remember, across the piece of paper, so that each time the pen would come down to the string, she'd feel it and she'd be able to know that that was at the bottom of the line, and she'd keep the lines straight. And so she laboriously, over 15, 20 minutes, wrote the letter, and it came to her dad, and you know, it was up and down and up and down every way. Because the string hadn't worked. At times it was loose and at times she hadn't felt it was there. But the dad was delighted because the intention was perfect. And the intention was pure. And he knew the trouble that she had gone to to please him. Now, that's what we mean by perfect obedience. It's a a, a state or an attitude which God can look upon and can see perfect purity and intention coming from our hearts. But our minds, you see, are impaired. Our emotions have been without the Holy Spirit for generations. And so our emotions are often unbalanced. Often we inherit some emotional imbalance from our mum or our dad. Often our mum is a gusher. And so we're gushers too. So we don't want to put the people off by the superficiality of our love. But we welcome them on Sunday mornings. And we give them the big welcome, you know. And it just suffocates them with motherly love. And they're just put off completely. And it's not because we intended to. Our heart was perfect and pure, but our emotions were unbalanced. And so it is with our bodies. Our bodies are often weak and tired. And we cannot do the things that the Spirit from within wants us to do. Now, that's why we don't come into sinless perfection. We come into perfect obedience. But because of impaired minds and unbalanced emotions and weakened bodies we often, in fact, end up in unintentional sins that we didn't intend to do, in words that we didn't intend to say, in emotional expressions that we didn't intend to express. Now, that's, brothers and sisters, what Paul means in Romans 6 and 19a, when he says, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. The word there in Greek for natural limitations is the word sarkos. And uh, the Greek students uh, this morning know that sarkos or sarks means the flesh. And it means not just the body, but the independent attitude that we have towards God. Now that independent attitude has two parts. It has a rebellious selfish will that doesn't want God's way at all. And it has minds, emotions and bodies that have been programmed for years in the wrong way. Now that's why Paul says, look, I'm speaking to you in human terms because of your natural limitations. Now what is he saying in human terms? Well, look at 6 and 18b. He says, you see, 18a, having been set free from sin, that's what we experience when we're crucified with Christ and cleansed from the old desire to have our own way. You have become slaves of righteousness. 
And then he says, now I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. In other words, he's saying, look, after you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, after you've experienced a real death to self with Jesus, don't you see that you have minds, emotions and bodies that are your melee, your members, that have been for years programmed to serve self. Now those things have to be reprogrammed. And that's why I talk about you becoming slaves of righteousness. In actual fact, you're not slaves. You're at last free for the first time in your life. You're free to disobey self and to obey God. But I'm saying that you then have to come into a willing slavery to let the Holy Spirit reprogram your mind, emotions and your will and your body into God's plan. And that's really what he's saying, you know. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now yield your members to righteousness for sanctification. In other words, sanctification, being made holy, or becoming like Jesus, or becoming like God, or having God's image restored in your life, is a twofold work. It is a crisis whereby you at last agree that I'm not going to live for self any longer. I'm willing to be crucified with Jesus as far as myself is concerned. It is a crisis experience whereby the Holy Spirit cleanses your heart from the desire to rebel against God. And then it is a process experience whereby your mind and emotions and your will are retrained and reprogrammed through you allowing the purity of Jesus to come through them and express itself to the world. And that's why, you know, I talked about the rewriting of the personality. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you can be freed from sin within and still have an old wildcat personality that needs to be rewrited and retrained by the power of the Holy Spirit. What, what is the way to do it? Oh, a bit like that old song, Georgie Girl, really. A bit like that. Let the First Corinthians 13 love that is never irritable or resentful smile with your mouth a bit more. Let the First Corinthians 13 love that is not jealous or boastful shine in the kindness of your eyes as often as possible. Let the First Corinthians 13 love that is not arrogant or rude express itself a bit more often through the gentleness of your hands. Let the First Corinthians 13 love that bears all things and believes all things and endures all things begin to express itself through your whole body so that the Holy Spirit can begin to reroute your old impaired mind and your unbalanced emotions, and your weakened body, into the real image of Jesus. So that in fact you can enter into real sanctification. And you can begin to become a person that reminds others of Jesus. And that's really what God is saying to us this morning, you see. And loved ones, that's why really I mentioned Jerry. I don't even know Jerry. I've never met him. I can't even tell which of you is Jerry. But I know that he's blind. And that's why I say to you, when you look at the help page, don't just offer up a very holy prayer to God for Jerry. Don't offer up a good holy intention for the sister that needs typing help. Let the Holy Spirit begin to express his purity through you. Now, if you say to me, oh brother, you're on behaviorist psychology. You say just... Do it often enough and it'll help you inside. No, no. That basket work approach just does nothing. It does nothing for you. What I'm saying is, allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse you inside and to rectify things inside so that you begin to have a real love of God and love of other people through your death to self with Jesus. And then let that express itself out through you. And all brothers and sisters, it's amazing the way you'll begin to find your personality acting automatically like Jesus instead of acting automatically like Satan. And it really does work. 
And it's just so different, you know. To begin to find it easier to live an unselfish cross life than to live an old self-centered self-life. And it does really work, my friends. It really does. And it's the way God meant us to go, you know. To be going out instead of going in. So I pray that God will lead you into it. I think there's a crisis work that is done in a moment. But there's another work that goes on week after week. And that's why we should be becoming a more and more beautiful image of Jesus every week. You know. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the completeness of your plan. We thank you, our Father, that it really works its way out through the fingertips. And it works its way out through our mouths and our eyes. And we thank you, Father, that your plan for sanctification is not just a once-for-all crisis experience, but it is a day-by-day expressing of the beauty that you have worked in us by that surgical operation, expressing that out through our whole personalities day-by-day and week-by-week. So, Father, we trust you that you will begin to teach us to rewrite our whole personalities so that we will be images of Jesus to each other and to your world so that the two and a half billion people who do not know you will again begin to see Jesus walking on your earth. We ask this in his name and for his sake. Amen.